And I started thinking, well, Josiah Warren's got it on the ball. What did he say worked? Well, one of the things that works is having a community where people have meals together. And that seems kind of, you know, weird that why does that matter? Why does it matter that people eat together? Why can't they just like grab some munchies and sit at the computer and stare into the computer forever? Well, it turns out that people build a lot of community. Just saying pass the salt, please, is, is like a, a, a way of reaching across the table and talking to someone. And uh, sharing meals causes people to feel that they're part of a family, kind of a community. They feel, they feel togetherness. And having discussions at mealtimes helps mm-hmm. people work out issues so that they don't become problems. And so there's a lot of power to this idea of let's have meals together. Let's have a place big enough, a community hall or a pavilion or a, you know, a campground, a, a fire circle, have some place where people can sit around and eat together and talk together. This will help the community stay together and grow. And I- All right, and welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self liberators paradise, pasnia.com. And uh, in regards to this podcast, one quick announcement. Uh, if you'd like to download the entire main TVP archive, uh, that is seasons one through three, up until January 2021 this uh, this year, uh, you can now do that via a one-click download. Uh, please reshare, upload anywhere and everywhere, uh, or just keep a copy for your personal archives, uh, whatever you like. To pick that up, just visit vanupodcast.com. And uh, there on the sidebar near the top, you'll see a Vani Podcast digital archive image. Uh, click that, and it will take you to the uh, LBRY, uh, the library download page. Um, now, it will take a minute, uh, five plus gigabytes, um, or if you're in rural, a rural area like I am, it might take you half the day if you're severely unlucky um, with traffic and congestion and all that. But uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, today we'll revisit the topics of uh, the second realm, uh, I guess libertarian country building, organizing, and uh, I guess similar subjects. Uh, reason being, not only is my guest one of uh, those rare folks who's well-versed in the aforementioned strategies, uh, but from what, what, uh, from what little I know, uh, he's had some uh, really interesting experiences. Uh, my guest is uh, Jim Davidson from Freedom Land um, Dow. So, uh, Jim, welcome to the Vani Podcast. Uh, it's 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 great to have you on. Uh, it's uh, uh, should have had you on a while ago, but uh, uh, you're here now. So, welcome to the Vani Podcast. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks, Shane. Thanks for having me on. Hey, not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. Like I said, uh, should should have had you on a while ago, and I came across. Uh, well, actually, it was uh, um, in one of your uh, in one of your posts there on uh, the Freedom Land Dow website. You linked to the Second Realm. Um, you linked to the uh, I guess I think it was the Second Realm book, and I I, I saw it on uh, my uh, my uh, stat tracking. Um, so I was glad to glad to come across it. I was very glad to come across it. Um, there's uh, a lot of folks um, I've noticed, especially like well, there's a lot of folks doing the same thing, but uh, there's just. Uh, um, it seems like well, a lot of us aren't really familiar um, with each other's projects, at least not um, not super, not not as familiar as uh, as I'd like us to be. So, um, yeah, I was I was very pleased to see that, and I'm glad to glad to get you on here to to chat. Um, but uh, I guess in our initial emails, you said you were uh, you were familiar with Vanu and considering your um, I guess your uh, I guess your your history and uh, I guess uh, libertarianism and anarchism. Um, I guess it's not really a surprise, but uh, you've you've come across Vanu in the past, uh, and I know before. I guess before a couple of years ago, before we really, I guess, I guess pushed to, to revive the freedom strategy, um, it was very, very obscure. So I guess if you if you could start just out of just, I guess, my, my own personal curiosity, uh, how did you come across Vanu in the past? And I guess uh, just tell us a little bit about that to start with. Well, I actually uh, don't remember all of the details, but I remember uh, a Vanu newsletter that I would have read in the late 1980s or early 1990s. I had gone over to uh, one of the Houston Space Society core members, uh, Alvin Carley, um, went over to his house and he had this this old, old newsletter. It looked old. I guess it had just been handed around from person to person and he said that this had you know, come to him now and uh, he was really excited about this because it looked like people who were interested in building new countries. And even back then, we kind of had a sense that we didn't live in a free country and that if we wanted to build our own space program, we would be prevented from doing so and that we needed to, you know, we needed to find some way of getting around the system. And uh, so that's 
that's my recollection of my first introduction to the to the term Vonu. Okay, interesting, interesting. And if if it was on country building, um, then I would it, it might have been preform inform. Then if it was uh, if it was maybe in the early to mid '60s, it was probably preform inform. Um, I, it wasn't really about country building. It was no. about living living away from the system, living okay. away from the state. But okay. that was the spin that my friend, my, my, my friends and I have been looking for a free country for a long time. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so that was, that was what he had in mind was that, you know, people could be free of the state, independent. And that's what he saw in it. You know, mm-hmm. people bring their own um, interpretations to the things that they read. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm definitely with you. Um, uh, I know that uh, Rayo, um, the main proponent of Vanu, um, early on, um, that was the uh, they had their, um, I guess, their Free Alice project, which I'm sure you're, you're familiar with uh, in the early '60s. Um, but yeah, obviously, g- generally speaking, yeah, uh, yeah, certainly Vanu is as I, as I, as I say a lot, Vanu is yours for the making. So yeah, whatever, whatever way you want to, uh, however you can make yourself more invulnerable to the state. Um, you know, uh, more more power to you. Fantastic. Um, so I guess what one thing you, you mentioned there that piqued my interest a little bit, um, the Houston Space Society. Um, that's very yeah, very interesting. It, could you can you tell can you tell any about that? Because uh, um, here at Pasney, we've got our own secret space program. So I wonder if there's any way. Uh, I'm curious if it's still around and if our fine organizations might be able to collaborate. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, anything on the Houston Space Society? Well, yeah, you can go to Houston Space Society. To- you can go to the Houston Space Society website. We've been around since 1988 as the Houston Space Society, and since 1977 as L5 Houston. We were founded uh, back in 1977 in response to the existence of Keith and Carolyn Henson's L5 Society, and. Um, one of our founding members, Clifford Carley, thinks that we might have been there even before 1977, but he doesn't have any records to reflect that. And uh, anyone who's been to Clifford's house knows that if there were records, he would have them. Um, <laughs> so he has uh, he has a lot of of of, of the past. Um, and, and I guess people probably don't know what the L5 Society is or where the term L5 comes from. L5 is one of the five um, solutions to the three-body problem in two dimensions as identified by the French mathematician Lagrange. So they're sometimes called Lagrange points. And uh, the two most stable are L4 and L5, and they sit ahead of and behind the moon in its orbit around the Earth. There are also... L4 and L5 points in the Jupiter Sun system, uh, where the Sun is the primary and Jupiter is the secondary, and then the third body in the problem is at the Trojan asteroid points. So if you look ahead of and behind Jupiter in its orbit, 60 degrees ahead and 60 degrees behind, there are these stable places where asteroids have actually gathered or been gathered, um, depending upon your view of the past. Interesting, interesting. So, um, with with that, uh, as you said, it's been it's been around for some time. I guess what's what's kind of the the status or the progress or I, I guess just like what's I I don't know what uh, I I'm not familiar with it and what's what's been worked on. I, I guess uh, could, could you tell? I, I guess is there I guess anything you can mention there? Well, one of the things that we used to do was produce uh, a newsletter called the Colonist, and by Colonist we meant space colonies. We uh, were advocates for the space migration movement, which is the idea that people living beyond the Earth could access the resources of space and we wouldn't need to have wars over oil. We could build solar power satellites and use John Freeman's, Dr. John Freeman of Rice University's photoclystron to directly convert sunlight to radio power and beam that power anywhere on earth that we wanted to receive power. Um, And a lot of us had read a lot of science fiction, so all of these ideas were very um, old hat to us. And the idea of advocating in favor of space migration as opposed to uh, war and slavery 
which are the primary ways in which the state makes its money. I think you know that. Mm -hmm. Uh, War is the health of the state, and uh, slavery is how they keep everybody in line. And so we were were advocates for that um, back in the 70s and 80s. The 70s were a really interesting time in America, and a lot of people uh, probably don't think of it this way. But we actually didn't like the CIA then. We didn't like the Pentagon then. The Pentagon Papers, the Frank Church Committee, um, the Select Committee on Assassinations, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, all of these things happened at a time when America had exposed the Nixon administration as brutally corrupt and evil and had exposed the secret bombings of Cambodia, slaughtering millions of people in Southeast Asia deliberately to no good effect. And it didn't help win the war. It didn't, you know, it didn't do any good, but it was something that Kissinger loved. He loved the idea of slaughtering people with bombs. Um, and I gather he still does. Um, so there was a lot of effort in the world to change, and the people who run the the the, the, the deep state is what we call it now, uh, the big alphabet soup agencies, the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, especially. Mm-hmm. Those people hate mankind, want to enslave everyone, want to murder everyone who gets out of line. They despise you and me and they don't want us to have any freedom, and they don't want us to have any choice. So they use their control of the hoax stream media to hurt people as much as possible, to censor people as much as possible. And I have been involved in the space migration movement, in the cypherpunk movement, in the new country movement all my life because I have known since I was in high school, since I was a teenager, that the people who really have power in this country hate mankind, want to slaughter 7 billion people in the name of Thomas Malthus and limits to growth. And they don't want us to have access to the resources of the solar system. They don't want us to have freedom. And uh, they hate us. So, um, you know, I have difficulty sometimes with uh, my expectation, the expectation that has been given to me by Jesus that I love my enemy. Mm-hmm. I I have trouble with that. I don't always. Sometimes I hate them right back. I know that they hate us, Shane, and I know that they want us to be enslaved. And I know that that probably sounds crazy to people. Oh, no, Jim. They don't hate you. They just want you to wear a mask for your protection. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. They don't want me to hide my face. They don't want to have a prior restraint on my freedom of expression. Right. So that's a little bit about me. I don't know. That that sounded more like a rant than a than a biography. Oh no, I I I appreciate it. And and that was going to be, I guess the the next question was more into your back, your, I guess your background and stuff that you've been you've been up to in the Liberty community. So I mean, we're we're we're, we're right on right on track to to where I was uh, where I was I was thinking about going. But um, I'm I'm curious. So so uh, Rayo, the the main proponent of Vani, was a very very forward thinker. He uh, he wrote about so in the late '60s. He wrote about the technocracy, uh, and uh, you know like he wants a he wants a, a lifestyle um, as uh, you know resilient to what you know the the worst technocracy that could develop. Um, so he's a very forward thinking individual and um he was obviously looking at you know what was going on in the world then and that was a major reason why he decided to, to pursue the radical lifestyle changes he that he that he pursued um i was not alive then i, I obviously I was, I was not alive then um so i'm, I'm curious like uh, the you kind of mentioned a little bit a little bit into the atmosphere but um to to my knowledge there was kind of uh, it there was a uh, where um, where there were libertarians, it was pretty much Southern California, or I guess California, and maybe generally is, is where a lot of libertarians were. Um, I guess could could you kind of talk? I guess talk to I guess um, how many? I guess uh, you know the size of the of the community to your knowledge at that time, and uh, I, I guess maybe um, I guess just the I guess the I don't know just your your experiences that. Um, your experiences and kind of what you recall, just out of my my curiosity. Well, the the sixties the sixties was a time when people were interested in freedom, and they were convinced that the world was not 
the way it was presented in Life Magazine and Time Magazine. And um, a lot of people kind of started the 60s um, involved in the civil rights movement, involved in the women's rights movement, and wanting to change things. And then John F. Kennedy's head was blown off deliberately, maliciously, and purposefully by Alan Dulles and George Herbert Walker Bush and their conspiracy of people who wanted to oust President Kennedy and put the much more malleable Lyndon Johnson in place. And they did that. And they then whitewashed the, you know, the, the story. Well, how did this happen? So the Warren Commission um, was, was a whitewash. And people, you know, Attorney Jim Garrison, many other people understood this. And so the 60s was when the CIA began using the term conspiracy theorist and began trying to hide the truth of what they had done from the American people. Um, and so there were a lot of libertarians, and it's actually very, very mistaken to say that they were mostly in Southern California. There was a, um, a guy named David Nolan, for example, in Denver in 1971, and it was in his living room that six people got together and founded the Libertarian Party. Uh, there were a lot of libertarians in Southern California, um, people like Samuel Edward Conkin III, and uh, J. Neal Shulman. Um, I corresponded with, with Sam a bit in 1999, 2000 time frame, and I corresponded a lot with uh, J. Neal Shulman. Um, and I mention them in particular because there are, have been different strategies over the years, and the strategy of getting involved in politics. And we're going to have... Uh, we're going to have to move the Libertarian Party headquarters from Denver to Washington, D.C., because it matters more to be in Washington than it does to keep distant from them. And so they did that, and, you know, the uh, Libertarian Party is, is, is garbage uh, as a result, as a direct result. To put it and, kindly, And I think yes. they're even in the Watergate complex. They, 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 yeah, and I think counterproductive in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Agorism, on the other hand, the agora is the Greek word for marketplace. And agorists think of market-based solutions so that you have many choices rather than just like the ballot choices. And they believe that the system is, is too broken to reform. As, as my friend Claire Wolf wrote in uh, 1995, America is at that awkward stage. It's clearly too late to fix anything by working within the system. And it's still a little too early to just start shooting the bastards. <laughs> in 2006, she came out with another uh, statement to the effect that it was no longer too early. So, uh, yeah. So, but but the concept of agorism is also not militaristic. It is, you know, self-defense is, is a good thing, but we don't expect to, you know, overthrow the system militarily and then replace it because then you just end up with a new empire. Mm -hmm. Agorism and voluntarism. Uh, go way, way back. And uh, one of the people who was key in this was a guy named uh, Robert Lefebvre, uh, who was the, the, the founder of the magazine Voluntarist, uh, one of the people involved in writing for that early on in the 70s and 80s was uh, my friend Wendy McElroy. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's been a long, long history of this, and it is a worldwide movement. Uh, students uh, for Liberty and uh, Liberty International got together in the 70s uh, and formed the International Society for Individual Liberty, which was destroyed by Barack Obama making some speeches and calling ISIL, uh, calling uh, the, 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 the group Daesh, ISIS. Um, he, he used the term ISIL. And so the ISIL website began to be attacked. And they, they have rebranded re as Liberty International. Obama did a lot of damage in his day, not just bombing people. But anyway, uh, so what happened? Um, gosh, well, um, my friend Michael Van Notten and I went to Somalia and tried to uh, start a free port there. We wanted to build a new Hong Kong. The Somalis were very enthusiastic. The deep state was very, very hateful about this. Um, <laughs> We weren't able to make that work. Um, 
that was at the beginning of the century. Uh, I I got involved in the New Country Foundation because I was arrested in 1991. Um, Friday, February 5th, was the 30th anniversary of my being arrested for felony gambling promotion of a lottery in Houston, Texas. Well, happy anniversary. Because unhappy my anniversary. friend Ardula went over to the Soviet Union and... Thanks. My friend Artula went over to the Soviet Union and got a contract with the space agency Glav Cosmos to put one American on the Mir space station for seven days. And so we organized the ultimate adventure sweepstakes. And we, being David Meyer, Howard Stringer, and I, basically the, the core members of the Houston Space Society at the time. Uh, and in December of 1990, we announced our sweepstakes, and people began calling the 900 number, and we were on our way. And in February of 91, the Harris County District Attorney showed up at our office and went back on his promise to discuss this and negotiate and move forward together and arrested us and charged us falsely. And in May of 1991, uh, he and the Texas Attorney General agreed to an injunction to drop the charges, and they admitted that it was a sweepstakes because the agreed injunction enjoined us from engaging in sweepstakes. In order for them to drop the false charges, we had to agree not to do something that's legal for everyone else, and we did. We agreed to that because our business had been destroyed. I lost everything. Um, I lost my house. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I ended up working in the real estate industry for a while, uh, which is an interesting industry. Most of the roads in Texas are built by uh, private companies on private land, and then they're turned over to the city or county government. That's how subdivisions work in Texas. Um, so anyway, I, I learned a lot about, uh, about the world quite suddenly because um, I – was doing a, a, a legitimate business, and then I was arrested, and I waded through two inches of raw sewage in old Harris County. Uh, every, every wall in the holding cells had a piece of paper on it that was required by the federal courts that said it was cruel and unusual punishment to be there. To be in those rooms was cruel and unusual punishment, and there was nothing that was ever done about that. I mean, they tore down old Harris County and they put up new Harris County, and I think they got the plumbing right for a while. But um, they they never they never contacted us to reimburse us for having been, you know, inflicted with cruel and unusual punishment because the system doesn't really care about people. Right. That was just a way of of getting federal authority to build a new jail, and right. and so they did. Um, so, so because my, my, my rights were violated in this manifest way, my illusions about the system were completely shattered. I had been a libertarian. I had voted for Ron Paul when he was the Libertarian Party candidate in 1988. I stopped voting after 1991. I, I don't vote. I don't think that we're going to vote our way to freedom. Um, I, I did campaign in 2007 through eight and in 2011, 12 for Ron Paul, not because I thought that he would win, but because I thought that he was delivering a consistent message for freedom, and this would bring a lot of people to the ideas of freedom, and this was a good thing. And that did happen. I think, I think Ron Paul's campaigns were good, but at the same time, um, you're not going to fix the system by working within it, and you're not going to probably fix the system by violently overthrowing it. The only way forward that I see is to create alternative places to live mm -hmm. and marketplaces in which to interact. And one of the important parts of that is free market money, something that, um, you know, Friedrich Hayek in 1976, and there are um, revised editions through 1990, um, Hayek wrote The Denationalization of Money. It's a really important book. People should read that. The denationalization of money says that, look, people are going to issue different currencies, and this is good. And we don't want to have one world currency. We want to have lots and lots of different currencies. 
Uh, E.C. Regal actually took it further in a book called The New Approach to Freedom, which I read because Michael Van Notten introduced me to a fellow named Spencer McCallum, who had written the 1970 classic uh, Art of Community. And uh, Spencer was interested in E.C. Regal's writings. E.C. Regal said, look, the people who are worst at issuing money are the people who steal for a living. Governments shouldn't be the ones issuing money. People who make stuff should issue money. A guy who makes shoes should issue shoe bucks. And then when you go to his store, you want some shoes. You say, hey, I got these shoe bucks when you came by and bought eggs the other day, and I'd like to buy some shoes now. And he says, okay, sure, yeah, we can do that. And other currencies would also you know, exist, like gold and silver coins. And so if you didn't have quite enough shoe bucks to make up the kind of you know, price of the really nice shoes that you want from him, well, then you, you, know, you, you, you throw in some silver. That's the concept of free market money, and that's the concept of competing currencies, and that's in Hayek's book, The Denationalization of Money. And I mentioned Friedrich Hayek because he's, he's a Nobel Prize winning you know, economist, so mm-hmm. he ought to know a thing or two. And he's dead now, so you know, we can't ask him a lot of impertinent questions. But the thing that happened in uh, 1990, uh, 1995 is that a guy named Doug Jackson founded a company called eGold and began issuing uh, digital currency that was warehouse receipts for gold and silver that he had in his possession. And then he started working with bullion depositories in London and Zurich and Dubai and, and he advanced the, the software in 2000, and he did start offshoring some parts of the organization. And he went on until there were over $50 billion a year in transactions in eGold in 2006. And that's when the government decided to get involved and destroy it in April of 2007. And that by then, there were other companies like eBullion and Gold Money and Pecunix and 1MDC. And so there was a whole bunch of competing free market money type digital gold currencies. And I was involved in that industry. I, I had, had bought a private stock exchange and converted it to uh, listing stocks with gold and silver as the, the denomination of the, the, the listings. And we were off to the races. Mm-hmm. And the government destroyed that. And, and, and if you read the e-gold white paper, and if, uh, sorry, the Bitcoin white paper in, 2000, in October of 2008, and if you, if, you, if you look into the conversations that were happening on the Agora at Anarplex where we talked about what was done to us, where we talked about how our, our fortunes were destroyed by falsehood, by, by the FBI deliberately lying. If you read Carl Mullen's book about the history of e-gold, you can you can understand our anger, and you can understand why the people who were part of the cypherpunk movement talked about the need to use things like you know Adam Back's hash cash and and Ralph Merkel's Merkel trees. I, I met Merkel in, in uh, 1995. Mm-hmm. He, he and I are both interested in cryonics, uh, you know, freezing our bodies after death. Um, I've I've a lot of confidence that what Bitcoin did starting in January of 2009 with the Genesis block changed the face of the world. And the fact that you are now able to automate through smart contracts on Ethereum and EOS and other platforms, you're able to automate away the bankers, make them go away. That's such a beautiful thing. Uh, DeFi, decentralized finance, changes the way the world is. It ruins the plans of the banking cartel. It makes them unnecessary. They are parasites. So finding a way around them was inevitable. It's going to happen eventually, and now it's happening. And, and um, you know, there's billions and billions of dollars now in decentralized finance. There's over a trillion dollars worth of cryptocurrencies. If you go to coinmarketcap.com, I think it was $1.1 trillion on Friday. That's a lot of money that is effectively outside of the control of the trusted central authority banking concept. And that's part of why they're doing what they're doing these days. They don't want us to be free, and they know that their days are numbered. 
They have seen the writing on the wall. Many, many tackle the shard. Yeah. So I've I've been ranting again. Sorry. No, you're good. That's that was all 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 great stuff. All great stuff. Um, I guess there there was. Uh, I want to I want to continue going forward to, um, you know, um, community building and such. But I, if I don't hammer down on this point, I feel like people are going to yell at me. Um, but you mentioned your project in Somalia. Can you tell? Can you give us? A, can you give us a, just a, a little more information? Some of the stuff that happened and and um, kind of uh, more details on that because so you, know, you know you know Somalia is a pretty um, a pretty hot topic within anarchist circles and such. <laughs> Well, that's right. That's right. If you if you don't want to to obey the government and do everything the government tells you to do, why don't you move to Somalia? Well, you tried that, did. right? <laughs> you tried I, it. I did that. So, I I I lived in Somalia, and uh, one of the criticisms I would have of Somalia is that there are too many governments in Somalia. There's way too much government there. It's hard to get along. Um, in 1991, as a result of a uh, what would be called a civil war, going back uh, to at least 1978, to the end of the Ethiopian-Somalia War. Uh, the people of the revolutionary movements overthrew the government of the dictator in Ziad Bere. And that was January of 1991. And by April, through a long series of meetings, they concluded that they had tried everything the West had to offer. They had had their own country up until 1866, I think, when the French came, and then the British came, and then the Italians came. And so they had tried being colonial, uh, you know, part of a colonial empire. That didn't work. That was terrible. They hated it. And so in 1960, they had overthrown Western-style colonial governments, and it installed democracy and merged British Somaliland with Italian Somalia, one country, and it was corrupt. It was corrupted by Western influence, and the, the, all of the bought politicians were a problem. So in 1969, Ziad Bure overthrew the government. I think he arrested the prime minister and uh, killed the president or vice versa. You can look this up. Um, but anyway, he became the communist dictator of Somalia. And in 1978, uh, because the Soviets had found lots of oil in the Ogaden, which was a province the British had given Somal uh, given away to Ethiopia, uh, the Somalis declared war on Ethiopia. And the Soviets backed the Ethiopians gave them military support, gave them fighter jets, trained pilots, all kinds of military advisors and support. And so uh, Ziad Bure in 1978 decided he was no longer a communist and uh, became a Western dictator supported by Saudi Arabia and the United States and the International Monetary Fund. And this went on for uh, a while they say, the UN says that um, a million Somalias, Somali people became homeless as a result of the Somali-Ethiopian War. And, and, and every year, to this day, they, they will gather the, the, the homeless people at the UN um, Committee on Refugees camps all over the area and, and, and count them up and say, well, for sure, there's still over a million refugees from that war. It's terrible. All, the, all, all this time since 1978. And then if you, if you look at it closely, you find out that, well, those people are nomads. They, they never had homes to begin with. They, they, they moved their herds around and, and lived in tents, and now they're living in refugee camps because there's food and water and kitchens and stuff, and they'll never stop being refugees because that's their lifestyle. Anyway, um, they concluded that they had tried being a communist dictatorship and they had tried being a Western dictatorship and they had tried democracy and they had tried the colonial empire. And in April of 1991, they said, go home. The, 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 the war is over. We won. The, the dictator fled. We're not going to form a new government. Oh, you're not going to form a new government. Oh, no. 
Well, who's going to pay the debt service? If the government doesn't get succeeded by another government, who will pay back the International Monetary Fund for $333 million lent in 1988, which the dictator used to create torture camps and to slaughter 30,000 civilians in Berbera? Oh, well, we're not going to pay that back. Oh, no. Well, I guess there's going to be a struggle for the control of Mogadishu. I guess there's going to be United States troops sent by George Herbert Walker Bush in December of 1992. I guess Clinton's going to expand that. I guess there's going to be a UN, you know, mission to Somalia. I guess there's going to be, you know, war in the streets of Somalia. Black Hawk helicopter shot down with American troops inside. I guess hmm. I guess we're just going to have to have we're just going to have to see about that. And what did we see? We, what we saw was that the 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 guy Mohammed Farah Idid, who was leading the Habergadir, was actually flown by the U.S. military in 1995 to I think it was Nairobi or Addis Ababa for a peace meeting where they said, "Hey, look, you become president, we'll back your play." You impose taxes. You start paying on the debt service. Everything will be fine. You'll be you'll be president of Somalia. And it was like uh, okay. He went back to Mogadishu within two weeks. His own bodyguards had killed him because the Somalis are done with that. The Somalis will not have a national government. They've tried that and they don't want it. And they would rather kill the person named as president, even though he was a hero of their you know struggle. They killed them because they don't want a president. They don't want a government. And in that context, in you know, 1995, I started working with Michael Van Naughton and the New Country Foundation, and we started planning a free port. We formed Somali Freeport Services. We formed the Adal Roads Company because we figured out that there was a there was a monopoly between Djibouti and Addis Ababa. There's one rail line. So there's one port. After the 1993 war with Eritrea, the the Ethiopians had no seacoast, and so they they were they were being exploited. And we thought, well, we'll build another port nearby. A lot of toll road up into those end of those mountains, and then we'll have a, a a nice a nice market opportunity there. And by market opportunity, I mean that in in um, in December of 2000, it was $50 to take a container off of a boat and put it on the dock at Jebel Ali Freeport in Dubai. And that same year, it was $1,500 to take a container off of a boat in Djibouti and put it on the, on, on the shore. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not the $1,500 does not represent you know, a free market. It represents a monopoly. And we wanted to bust that monopoly up a bit and uh, build a toll road from our new port at uh, Bolado up into Ethiopia and serve that market. And it would make lots of money for the Somalis, and they recognized that, and they were excited about this. And the guy who used to be part of the secret police for Ziad Bure, a guy named um, Dahir Riali, decided that we weren't going to do that. And so he said, Michael, you and Jim have to leave the country now. And we did. And so that that project uh, ended. And then we tried to reorganize as a fishing operation. We started working with some of the Somalis about moving a fishing fleet into position and having the Somalis operate it. And in... August of, of uh, sorry, August of 2001, I was told that I should leave Djibouti, go home, and I said, "Well, am I being, you know, am I being deported? Is that what's happening?" And they said, "No, no, no. You're welcome to come back. We just think you should go home now." This was like the 30th of August, hmm. and so I was in Texas in September of 2001. And now you can't say September. In those days, September 2001 is just like you know, it's hey, it's September now. Nobody thought anything of it. But now you can't say September 2001 without people thinking about, you know, planes crashing into buildings and buildings falling down and 
and lies uh, from the deep state to grab more power. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I was uh, in September of 2001 in Texas. And um, in October of 2001, NATO General Tommy Frank said that the official policy of NATO is to bomb all the port facilities in Somalia. And the people who wanted to invest in the free port uh, they stopped taking my calls, Shane. Yeah. I know. It's scary. They did not wire the money to go buy the port facility and, and, and haul it to, to Africa. It's just another project that got eaten by the state. Yeah. So that's my story. It's about Somalia. I can tell you some proverbs from Somalia if you want. <laughs> um, the Somalis have a proverb, in the forest, some trees grow taller. I love this. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Um, yeah, that's that's all. Uh, I guess that's that's uh, um, all very very interesting. And 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 yeah, I mean that's uh, that's what the state does. Um, that's uh, what the state does, and that's why uh, that's why uh, I guess uh, Pasnias. I guess I have the vision for Pasnia that I that that I kind of do. And and I want I want to get to more 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 kind of the solution stuff now. Um, but uh, and one of uh, one of your articles, uh, um, and and I think this kind of introduces. Um, the way that the way that you kind of look at community building and also um, overlaps with kind of what kind of what I'm what I'm thinking too. But um, you said, "quote But if we su subdivide the land that gets the state and county government involved, if we keep it all one unit, they don't have to know what they don't have to know what arrangements we've made. We're viewing it as a sort of religious community, and that of the zero aggression principle represents a and that the zero aggression principle represents a shared belief system. Sim similarly, if we register wells and septic, septic tanks and all kinds of other things with the state, they're going to be all kind. They're all going to going to be all kinds of inspections and detections and, uh, and this and that. We want to avoid having the parasites anywhere near the property. So we're implementing alternative technologies, uh, end quote. Um, yeah, for sure. So, so I guess could you just kind of, um, and I guess this, this probably ties in with uh, the, your, your, I guess your current projects, Resilient Ways and, and Valiant. Um, could you tell us, I guess, uh, your, your approach to uh, community building and kind of uh, what you see as the, the vision for the future in that area? Okay, yeah, sure. So, um uh, you mentioned Resilient Ways, and I did create a Resilient Ways Foundation, and uh, we used to have a website. It's probably in the, in the Wayback Machine, uh, resilientways.net, um, and that's the email address that you contacted me from because that's where I have my published, uh, my, all my essays um, point back to that address. Um, the idea of Resilient Ways was the, the idea that um, there are efforts to create new places to live, like uh, La Estancia Cafayate in Argentina. It's a million-acre ranch that Doug Casey bought, and then he developed for a uh, libertarian community down there. Uh, Argentina makes it almost impossible to be an entrepreneur in Argentina, so um, especially if you're a foreigner. So some people got together and started a project called uh, called Sculpt Chile, which went very badly. Um, one of one of the people involved uh, turned out to be a fraud uh, artist, a con artist, and so um, people lost their money in that. Uh, but the, the 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 pieces of that were picked up by a guy named Gabriel Shear, who started FortGalt.com, and that's in Chile. Uh, I have a friend in Belize who has created the Pine Ridge Community Project. I have a friend in Eastern Europe who's created a project in the Carpathian Mountains. I used to work with a guy in Japan who was working with some people in Burma. That project didn't go very well, so he stopped doing that. Um, but at the time, I thought, well, I will, I will start you know, documenting where, where these things are, and we can talk about how, how this could work better. How, how can we go about making a better world? Well, I think it begins locally. I think it begins by building a community of people who have a common belief. And what common belief? You have to believe in Jesus. Well, you can believe in Jesus if you want. And I think he was a voluntarist, so that works for me. But you don't. Right. You can be you know, an agnostic or an atheist or a Buddhist or any number of things and be a voluntarist. You, your core belief is the zero aggression principle, or what people call the non-aggression principle. <clears throat> I don't like I don't like non-aggression principle because it's it, you know people fall asleep, they take a nap. I prefer zero aggression principle because it's got more zap. 
Uh, but, you know, call it what you like. The idea is that this is the shared belief system and that um, by imposing aggression through voting and through taxation and through these other things the state does, they are denying your consent. They're saying your consent doesn't matter. Or they're saying, you know, John Jacques Rousseau said this, they're saying that your, your consent is implied in the social contract. Do you believe that, Shane? Do you believe in the social contract? Have you ever seen a copy of the social contract? <laughs> I have not. <laughs> I have not. I have not either. I don't think the social contract exists. I think that's fraud, man. I think it's, it's whatever the people in power wanted, wanted to say. And so I don't believe that, that there is any implied consent. I believe that consent has to be manifest. If, if, if you say that I didn't rape that young lady because there was implied consent, and she says, I didn't consent, well, then I believe her. Sorry, you know. Sorry, Mr. Rapist, I'm not going for that. I think that, you know, if she says that she didn't consent, then, then you know, there's a problem. And if, if, if there was a struggle, if there was, you know, if, if, if there's claw marks on your face, I'm going to say, you know, you were aggressive, weren't you? That's a bad thing. Stop that. Stop being aggressive. Stop raping people. I would like to say that to the state, but I don't think it'll do any good. I think the state will keep on raping people. Uh, and, you know, and so I don't think we're going to build a free world by having a war because that'll just bring in some other power structure that will be just as bad. I don't think we're going to vote our way to freedom. I think we have to build our way to freedom. And that means building in a lot of places, little communities. And that idea has, has kind of taken off since September of last year yep. when I started Freedom Land DAO. The idea of a DAO is a distributed autonomous organization, an organization that if it has any structure at all, is in smart contracts, is in uh, documented uh, code on a blockchain or on some platform so that nobody is in charge. I don't want to be in charge. I just want to be a person who knows people and you know, makes introductions. That's all I want to do. I want to prove Davidson's corollary to Metcalf's law. Metcalf's law says that you know a, a, a network is more powerful if it has more nodes, and I say my corollary is that that network is more economically profitable to its members if there are more interconnections among the nodes. And I think I can prove that. And I've been introducing people like, like, like crazy for, for decades now. I've been looking for a free country for 30 years, and there are none. And there's a reason for that. There's a, there's a set of people in the world who want to enslave us, who don't want us to be free, and who don't want us to have new countries. They destroy the Republic of Mer Minerva. They burned sea land to the waterline. They destroyed the, um, what was it, uh, in, in the Italian um, Rose, uh, I think it was called Rose City or something. That was another offshore platform project. Um, you know, they, they destroyed our work in Somalia. They destroyed e-gold. Everywhere that they've been able to cause independent freedom projects to be destroyed, they have done that. And that's the neat thing about cryptocurrencies is that you know there's nobody to attack. If you if you go and, and arrest, uh, I don't know anybody who pretends to be Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, it doesn't prevent eagle. Uh, it doesn't prevent Bitcoin from continuing to operate. Bitcoin gets yeah. bigger and bigger every year. You know, what is it now? Forty forty thousand dollars for a Bitcoin? Is that right? <laughs> yep. Yep. Thereabouts. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely uh, with you. I'm definitely with you. I, I it's uh um it's it's got to be it's got to be spread out, it's got to be distributed. And um basically uh that's that's kind that's yeah, exactly where my thinking is at. Uh, permanent autonomous zones all over the place and uh 
basically build build communities there and and then you know work, working in vanu vanu um, a lot of vanu lifestyles are, are nomadic um well one of the downsides with with nomadism is that uh, if, like if you're a van nomad for example you can't store you can't store a bunch of food you can't you can't store a lot of stuff in a van right um that's that's a downside but if you have this network of permanent autonomous zones this network of um of uh i guess uh of uh, freedom lands uh, a network of these DAOs, like um you can always have um if you're if you're a try if you're a perpetual traveler you can always have a, a safe like-minded place to, to to go and uh then as as you were saying the importance of building community um yeah intentional communities all over the place um and uh you know um build up uh, as i've as i've been putting out you know uh, the, the second realm content um you know keep building up these alternative institutions alternative infrastructure um and make it where we don't need them at all um we've we've, we've got we've got everything we need and our interaction can be very very limited um, with the first realm with the survival society um so yes yeah, it seems like we're, we're, we're kind of on the same page there and it's, it's obviously not not my idea um it's a, just a merging of the the second realm a lot of the second realm stuff temporary autonomous zones which i'm sure you're sure you're familiar with and permanent autonomous zones um and uh yeah gorism uh, um, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, mer- a it converging of all of these of strategies it goes back it goes back into the 19th century with intentional communities uh, New Harmony and other ones like that. Uh, a guy named uh, Josiah Warren did a lot of important work documenting what worked and what failed and you know how to make these things go better in the future. And Wendy McElroy wrote up uh, an analysis of that work uh, that, that Josiah Warren had done and so I read that in, in, in the uh, mid-1990s at uh, L. Neal Smith's The Libertarian Enterprise. And I started thinking, well, Josiah Warren's got it on the ball. What did he say worked? Well, one of the things that works is having a community where people have meals together. And that seems kind of you know weird that why does that matter? Why does it matter that people eat together? Why can't they just like, grab some munchies and sit at the computer and stare into the computer forever? Well, it turns out that people build a lot of community. Just saying pass the salt, please, is, is like a, a, a way of reaching across the table and talking to someone. And uh, sharing meals causes people to feel that they're part of a family, kind of a community. They feel, they feel togetherness. And having discussions at meal times helps mm-hmm. people work out issues so that they don't become problems. And so there's a lot of power to this idea of let's have meals together, let's have a place big enough, a community hall or a pavilion or a, you know, a campground, a, a fire circle, have some place where people can sit around and eat together and talk together. This will help the community stay together and grow. And another thing that Josiah Warren said, which I think is really clever, is that um, if the community has a community money, if if you have money that is is you know issued locally and is spent locally then it doesn't go away when you know when you go to walmart you spend federal reserve notes you're using their money and then that money is going to china to bring in goods and services and if you're in the in the vanu community pasnia why don't you use PAS bucks? And mm-hmm. PAS bucks are spent locally and, and maybe even issued locally so the seniorage gets, gets uh, captured by someone locally. And the PAS bucks, uh, you know, a, a, if it's at all possible, it's spent within the community. And if it's not possible, then maybe it's spent with another nearby, uh, you know, freedom community. And if that's also not possible, if what you really need is something that nobody else makes, well, then sure, you you know, you convert to Federal Reserve notes or you convert to whatever is accepted uh, online and you order something online and it's delivered. Uh, But that's those, I think those are two really, really important features uh, that people should have in their, in their thinking about how am I going to make a community that's going to last? Because having a community that doesn't last, well, we've done that before. Right. We've done a lot of that. But making something that, that, that survives and um, is resilient, and I think even better yet is Nassim Taleb's concept of anti-fragile, something that grows stronger when it has resistance, when, it, it, you know, when, when, it, when you look at the muscle system in the body exercise and resistance instead of breaking down muscle tissue builds it up and makes it stronger 
Well, that's what you really want. You want every time the system tries to attack your community, your community becomes stronger, that's anti-fragility. And, and I don't quite know how to build that into communities yet, but I know that that's a goal. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm definitely with you. I'm definitely with you. And I guess to 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 kind of even even take it a step further. So so Pazni is kind of the uh, the the overall idea. And then I uh, I I figure there can be like yeah an over as you're saying an overall network. Um. So yeah, it'd be it'd be awesome. Um. Yeah. That's 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 a yeah really really good idea. I've just been thinking Bitcoin. Yeah. Bitcoin and crypto is good. So, um. That's a, 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 at least a, a good decentralized uh, approach for for now. Um. But yeah, I, I like that idea. I definitely definitely like that idea. Um. I guess. Um, so you you mentioned that there's uh, there's uh, there's a lot of activity happening um, since since September. Um, could you uh, I guess do you, do you want to uh, I guess tell us tell us a little bit more about uh, about uh, what's what's developing that, that that you're seeing? Well, sure. So um, since September, I have been in contact with a lot of people who are just clear that you know they can't take it anymore. They, they want to go out in public without a mask. They want to be treated like it's okay to hug each other. Social distancing is making them sick. Masks are making people sick. And the system is clearly trying to impose enough constraints on Americans that we go to war with each other or something. I don't know what their plan is, but it's clearly it's clear to a lot of people that the that the strategy is the same failed state strategy that they've imposed in other places and with their color revolutions and this and that. And so I now know of people building freedom communities with uh, land that they have located in four provinces of Canada and I think 15 states in the United States, in Belize, in Mexico, in Chile, in the Carpathian Mountains of Eastern Europe. And uh, that's progress just since September, is that all of these things have been started. And then in Oklahoma, my friend Mike Swadek and I found, uh, actually he found a listing for 185 acres, and we developed a very detailed plan. Uh, it's in our Telegram channel, so if you look for Valiant Underbar Community, that's the, um, the broadcast channel, and then there's a Valiant Community Chat. Oh, I should probably say what Valiant stands for. Valiant is, is voluntarists and agorists living in absolute non-aggression today. I like it. And, and Valiant, so that's a nice acronym. I, I made that up, and I said, let's call it Valiant, and he said, yes, do that. And so um, we started this project, and uh, he found the land, and, and he's an engineer and, and knows a lot about um, uh, drainage systems and, and land use, and so he planned where the roads would go and found the power uh, power lines and, and, and found ways to integrate that into the community, and we began talking about, you know, we'll put the storage shelters here for people to do self-storage while they're moving in, and, and, and we'll have a campground, and we'll have RV park, and we'll have a, a you know, a, a bed and breakfast here, and we'll have, have a restaurant so people can get together and, and have meals. And we and we we divided up the lots and we found four springs on this property. Great property. And Sunday, the thirty first of January, we were told it's no longer for sale. Mm -hmm. The Zillow listing. We called, we talked to the realtor and we, we began making our plans and now it's been taken off the market. So, um, so we, that's a bit of a setback for us, but um, there are other places. And in the meantime, because we've been we've been working on this, about um, 155,000 dollars has been committed by people who who like this idea and want to get involved. So, very good. That's that's the good news out of all. Of yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I saw um, on the on the website that Mike was Mike was involved. Uh, I'll mention uh, Agora Stop Market. Um, I've I haven't had the pleasure of meeting him yet, but uh, I can already tell he's uh, he's a yeah, really, really good, really good dude. But we've uh, he's got uh, Iowa publications listed there uh, at Agora Stop Market. So I, I definitely appreciate um, and, and Pazny is uh, listed there, too. So I, I definitely appreciate uh, what he's doing there over at Agora Stop Market and definitely go um, check that out. Uh, I think that that's really the most critical next step is is connecting and networking people. Um, and uh, um, 
yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of people, whether whether it's, um, you know, yeah. bigger projects like, uh, you know, 150 acres or if it's just individual homesteads that are, you know, working towards self-sufficiency, places where people could camp out if they're traveling or, if, or, or for whatever. Yeah. Um, it's really about bringing people together and networking now. Um, and and, and it's, it, there's a lot of good progress happening in that in that direction, it seems. Absolutely. And there's an event coming up that you guys might want to uh, uh, tell your listeners about which is uh, going to be in April. I think it's the 17th, 18th, and 19th. But the site is midfest.info, and the event is called Midfest. And uh, there's going to be volunteerists from all over the country gathered together to, you know, uh, well, you know, we'll just see about that. We'll see, we'll see what we can do together to make the world a better place. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I, uh, I, I hopefully, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's hard. Like I, there's so many festivals I want to go to and there's, there's a, I want to get, I want to go on a, um, yeah, I want to basically take a whole year off and just travel around freedom festivals. Well, there, there was a lot of them. There was a lot of them. And it seems hopefully there's going to be, that's, that's going to come back around. Um, again, there's plenty of festivals, but unfortunately, unfortunately at the same time, um, like I've got a bunch of, I've got uh, goats and lambs and I've got uh, 24 duck eggs incubating now. So I'll have a bunch of, bunch of birds. Like I'm going to have a hard time leaving the homestead for like more than a couple days. Um, so like I've, I, I thought about it. Like I, 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 I guess I really didn't, I, I didn't think that part through, like I probably won't be able to leave that much. Um, <laughs> at least, at least while I'm getting, getting things ironed out, but, um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll definitely add, I'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes. Well, that's I, okay. certainly, the, the certainly cool encourage everyone to get out the, there. The, we have all of this internet technology. So we sure. have all this internet technology, so you can just like you know participate remotely, or you can send a friend and and tell them to report back. And there's a lot of ways to get past the, the limitations on travel that oh yeah come from. I I do know about livestock. Livestock is very very dependent on the helpfulness of the people who care for the livestock. Yeah, yeah. Yep, indeed, indeed. You can't, you can't not feed them one day. If you not feed them one day, then they stop being. It's terrible. Yep. Yep. It's it's uh it's it's not just something. Yeah, it's not just something you can just take a couple of days off. Yeah, exactly. You're right. Yep. Yep. Um. Yeah. There's there's a lot a lot of lots of benefit from it though. Um. And plus, uh, you know, I I I'm uh you know working towards self work, working towards self sufficiency myself, and then I I do want to obviously turn you know turn outwards too. And when people come here, um, I mean, haven't had a I mean, I just got basically I basically just got started with the 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 homestead last year really really full bore but uh yeah you were talking about like i had a i called it, it was a pasney and thanksgiving had people out here for um you know five or six people came out here um for the weekend or for, yeah for the uh, for the holiday weekend and um yeah just spontaneously we didn't plan anything but we were all made like we all um ate together and made like these big dinners with fresh lamb that we just processed um like uh it was just yeah, really really incredible um and it was just all spontaneous the food was incredible um so yeah, like that's I'm yeah I'm all about that, all about that, and and that's why I'm I'm really happy, um you know m m mentioning second round book on strategy again and just that strategy in general, um that that cultural element is just so so critical, um really really critical part of that community. So um I yeah I'm I'm definitely definitely with you, and I'll turn over turn over there for you. I don't really have a question, but um if you have any comments. Well, no, I, I really think that this is this this kind of show you're doing right now. Uh, this this conversation is is part of making a a, a big difference. And and I know people who um, I have a friend in, in Seattle who goes through some very dark times. He has a podcast, and I've been on it a bunch. But um, a lot of the people in the freedom community get very depressed because they see how powerful the enemy that we're up against is and how much dedication and support they have for their goal of, you know, eviscerating freedom and enslaving everyone. And it sometimes looks hopeless. And so talking about Pasnia and talking about Valiant and talking about these other freedom communities gives people hope and that gives people an opportunity to, to find that there is action they can take. And it matters if the action is to raise chickens and grow eggs, and if the action is to you know do permaculture or uh, you know aquaculture at your home, or if the action is to get together with other people and buy a land and develop a community, or if the action is to just you know keep 
keep hope alive through a conversation, through podcasts and through discussions. All of these things will help because in many ways, if you look at the vast scope of human history, we are watching the collapse of a civilization. We are watching a system fall apart. And at the same time, we're watching people build a new way, build a way that doesn't depend upon centralization and doesn't depend upon bankers and and bureaucrats and, and parasites. And if we can, if we can, if we can keep, doing that and, and, and bring more and more people in. I think that, you know, it's very much like the vision in Daniel chapter 2 where Nebuchadnezzar saw the stone that was carved out without human hands smash all of those empires into chaff, and then the stone grows to fill the whole world. We can be that. We can be that stone. We can, we can be stronger than the system that is trying to subjugate us. But we yes. can't do that without effort. It will take a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're 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 certainly right. You're certainly right. And the way I've been putting it uh putting it lately is um you know u- utilizing our generative force of creation to build Eden, not Babylon. Um so like that's that's kind of what uh it's kind of beautiful know, yeah, i love that mm-hmm. i love that that is such a great phrase um so yeah that's 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 the way that i'm putting it as uh you know that eden no but, uh, i guess just a society um you know based on based on volunteerism that's that's all you know and and you know working with nature not against it um that's i think that's re- really i don't know foundational um, well, I agree. That's 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 really that's really good thinking. Awesome, awesome. Well, Jim, we've been going for about an hour here, and I want to I want to respect your time. Don't want to keep you keep you too long. Um, I guess to to kind of uh, to kind of begin to close out here. Um, yeah, I guess I guess we, we we've talked about uh, you know the very very positive vision for um uh, the very positive vision for um for the future building community. Um, I guess just I'll just turn it over to you. General closing thoughts. What what would you like to leave the listeners with? I would like the people who are listening to think about ways that they can form community in their own home or in their town, or in some place nearby. And I would also invite people to think about um, 60 years in Vietnam. Between 1919 and 1979, the Vietnamese people took on the French, Japanese, French, American, and People's Republic of China empires. And Vietnam is an independent country today because they kept fighting until they got what they want. I want people to think about Afghanistan and about the mountains of, you know, the Rocky Mountains and the Ozarks and the Appalachians. In North America, there's a lot of mountain chains. There's a lot of places where you can move from one place to another without uh, necessarily being tracked from the sky all the time. A lot of swamps in, in Louisiana and elsewhere, uh, the swamps of Florida. And so I invite people to think about fourth generation warfare and, and the possibility that just staying alive, just keeping out of the hands of the system is a, a worthy objective and it's a goal that can be achieved. But you have to stop thinking that you're going to build a castle. Mm-hmm. We're not castle builders. We're not empire builders. We're freedom builders. Right. And that requires a different way of thinking because castles can be destroyed, oceans can be crossed, so you can't build a, a moat big enough to, you know, to, to protect your castle. And mountains can be you know, scaled and you can't build a, a high enough you know, place to, to, to be irresistible. They have airplanes and satellites and stuff. So don't be thinking about creating a permanent redoubt and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a cul-de-sac into which you're going to escape. You're not going to escape into a cul-de-sac. You're going to be destroyed and surrounded mm-hmm. in a cul-de-sac. So, so don't, don't enslave yourself either. Um, but right. those, are, those are just some parting thoughts. I really, really think that, that building new places, building places for people to be free, both online and in the real world, matters a great deal. 
and um, we have a lot of technologies that can support us. Uh, it's it's possible to you know put a factory in a container and then take a truck and haul that container to a place where Thank there's three phase power and you set up and you you make the widgets and then you 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 close the shop and you disappear before the tax man gets there. Uh, that's possible, and people should be doing all kinds of things that 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 they love. Because if you love it, you'll bring all of your best ideas to it. And it's time. It's time to stop being part of the system. The system is broken, and it's not going to get better. Yep, right there. Yep, right there with you. Right there with you. And um, I would just uh, leave the leave the listeners with with uh, the comments of, of of yeah, you know, definitely incorporate. Uh, you know, as, as you're building these communities, <clears throat> think about uh, incorporating as many of the second round principles as possible, um, security culture principles, and more more generally. But um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Lots lots of good stuff. So um, Jim. Uh, um, I guess uh, I'll, I'll let you. I'll, we'll kind of leave it there for now, and can always get you back on to, to chat in the future. Um, where can people find? Uh, where can people find your um, your, your websites, your projects, and uh, keep up with what you're doing? Well, the the latest is Freedom Land Dow. That's uh, Freedom Land D A O dot com. So there's a lot of double letters. And actually, when I was when I was registering it, I also registered Free Edom Land because I put too many E's. <laughs> And I, I looked at it and I was like, that's not freedom land, that's free, there's an extra E in there. So I had to, I had to re-register the domain to get, get what I wanted. But freedomlandow.com, I'm also published frequently at igluluau.com at the Libertarian Enterprise, which is ncc-1776.org. And yes, that's a Star Trek reference. Um, and then the, uh, the Telegram channel is uh, Valiant Community Chat. And if searching for that doesn't get you there, why then just send me an email, Jim at resilientways.net. All right, very good, very good. And um, and I know you you sent me an email asking about, about asking about Bonnie Fest. I'll mention here for the for um, for everyone else too. Last year we weren't uh, weren't weren't doing any marketing for it. This year still not ready to market for it. Um, basically, I've got my 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 first layer of trust, and and pe- the only people that come out here are, are vetted. Um, so I like you. I know you, Jim. You're you're welcome out here. But the it, I, the the way that I'm kind of putting it for marketing now is just as kind of a joke. Since pe- I have to know, like this is where I live. Um, like I'm not just gonna have random people out here right now. Um, so like the idea is you know, like to promote Vanu Fest and just be like, yeah, well you can't come. Um, and it really you know really good for um, you know building up a, a list of interested that. people. Um, <laughs> So yeah, let's make yeah make make it make it make yeah, make. Yeah, we're having fun with us because you're not invited. Yep. I don't know you. I love that. That's very wise. I love yep. it. This is so good. Yeah. So um. So yes, you're you're welcome to come out for for Vani Fest. It's uh it, the last weekend in September. Actually, I guess it'll be the last. It'll start the last Monday, uh, in September. It'll be a, a whole week long this year. Um, for for Vani Fest too. And then uh, we're also having. Um, there's a lot of demand for it. I was blown away. Like I, I people are w- wanting to come out to, you know, Southern Illinois for some reason. I didn't, I didn't think people would come out here, but, um, yeah, end of last weekend in March, we're going to have a little camping and riding weekend out here as well. More of kind of an unofficial event. Um, but yeah, there's, I'm surprised behind people, like people coming from Colorado, like it's going to be an actual, like, fe- like it's going to be a little mini festival, I think. Um, and then, uh, you know, if there's demand, if there's further demand after well, that, we might, man. we might have another I'm, one I'm in summer to too. It, so. Yeah. Well, that's cool because I, I definitely want to come. Uh, I have, you know, trenching criticisms about Southern Illinois because um, Illinois. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I do too. <laughs> trust me. Yeah. Illinois is such a mess, but you guys are avoiding that, so that's good. Uh, and and uh, I want to I, I want to come in, in in September. And and there's a lot of time between now and then. Uh, one of the other events I will be going to probably this year again uh, is Jackalope Freedom Festival in mm-hmm. August. That's in um, usually in Sick Graves National Forest in uh, Arizona. So I will instead of instead of you coming to Midfest and Jackalope Fest, Shane, why don't I just come to your event in September? I will bring, bring you a report. And I will bring the goods and services that people say, hey, hey, Jim, Shane, Shane will buy this. Why don't you take it to him? I will be the agorist delivery service for you. Fantastic. And then, and then we can sit around your campfire and, and talk about it and maybe even get on the podcast. Yes, yes, that's, uh, that, that all sounds great. That's, uh, that all sounds great. Um, 
yeah would love hope yeah hope, hope it happens come out come out here for for the september event and um yeah for i guess for for the folks out there in podcast land who obviously you want to come to this like obviously you want to um go to paznia.com sign up for sign up, get, get on the email list it's a good list to be on um unlike a lot of lists nowadays um but yeah get on that email list i'm not gonna ask for any personal identifiable information just your first name um so i can make it more personable um but uh but yeah i will uh email updates there and, and get in the telegram group um and that's uh, that's kind of the the, the first place uh, to start building your reputation in the underground and uh then you'll be moved through further channels um and then eventually you'll be um allowed to visit um yeah as, we, as that's that's the way we got to do things or at least the way, way i'm doing things um but uh um anyway you gotta do it a piece of the time that's right yep going going slow building at my own building at my own pace and um yeah that's that's Going, going good so far. So yeah, Jim, th thank you so much for coming on, man. It was a really, really great conversation. Uh, have to do it again in the future. I'll drop all links uh, to, to your stuff in the, in the show notes. But um, yeah, for now, I appreciate you coming on and uh, appreciate, I, I look forward to, to seeing you in September. That sounds great. Thanks, brother. Hey, bye bye. <laughs> Not a problem. We'll see you later. All right, guys. And uh, there you have it. Uh, Jim Davidson. Um, Wow, what a uh, what a what a just a fantastic, fantastic conversation, um, and uh, looks like he he just hopped off uh, Jitsi. Okay, cool. So I'll go ahead and and, and record uh, record this outro and conclusion now. Then, um, but yeah, just fan fantastic, fantastic conversation. Uh, I knew he had a, had a deep history within uh, within libertarianism, but I didn't. I I guess yeah, I didn't know all those details. Uh, I did not know all those details. Uh, I was familiar with the Somalia project though, which is yeah. I, I knew there was going to be some good stuff, um, good stuff there as far as libertarian history. You know, I I, I nerd out with some of that stuff, um, especially with all the archiving archiving I'm doing with uh, of all these uh, old Vani publications. But um, and yeah, the the community community building stuff. Uh, it's it's so awesome to see. Um, so awesome to see this just it's just organically organically happening um it's just it's just it's just happening um you know he said like uh you know there's there's you know these the restrictions are getting are getting worse and people are, are getting to a, a breaking point um and uh i i i definitely see that uh, i definitely see that coming in and, and i usually wouldn't um i usually wouldn't have like a real optimistic outlook um of the future especially after 2020 right like um especially like if you'd ask if you would have asked me uh, you know, March or April of last year, if I'd have had a positive outlook um, on the future of freedom, like I probably wouldn't have, um, probably wouldn't have. But, you know, a lot has happened in the past year. And as far as, you know, whatever, whatever nonsense is happening, whatever nonsense distractions are happening in the survival society, um, the underground is being built, connections are being made. And um, those who um, want desire freedom, uh, we will have it. Um, we will have it. Uh, despite what those who falsely imagine themselves to be our rulers uh, do uh, in the meantime, before uh, you know, will they will they collapse civilization? Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyway, we're 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 building up uh, we're building up uh, I guess the 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 new. So um, let me see if there's uh, if there's anything else I wanted to <sighs> I wanted to comment on here. I don't think so. I'm gonna take a moment before I hit stop because I I I want to want to make sure. Um, but no, I, I I guess that's I guess that's pretty much it. Um, Good libertarian history, uh, and yeah, just uh, lots of uh, lots of valuable experience um, in the in the community building realm. Um, so uh, yeah, please go check out all of his uh, all of his websites, all of his projects. And um, as for for me, libertarian type uh, libertarian type publications is uh, where to go to support this podcast. It's our partner, uh, you know, partner outfit. Um, we focus on uh, books. We, we yeah, we sell books uh, on self liberation, libertarian philosophy, history. Um, all those things, crypto agorist uh, fiction. Um, he mentioned the uh, the uh, hashtag agora anaplex. Um, well, we we uh, we uh, sell the uh, hashtag agora book uh, as well as second round book on strategy. Um, of course, you can find those all for free online. Nothing we put out um, is goes behind a paywall. Um, it's all yeah, all of it goes out for free. It's just if you want to support the podcast and if you want a paperback copy of these things, um, that's that's why it's there. But all of this stuff is available for free. Um, if it's if there's not an easy link available to it, it's very easy to find. Um, you might just have to do it. You might have to take a step to find it. Um, but most of the time I make it, I make it pretty easy. Um, otherwise, vonniepodcast.com is where to go for, for this podcast. Um, yeah, i I guess there's, uh, there, there were a couple updates that I, that I put there. I mentioned the, um, that's uh, seasons one through three uh, are now available for free download um, the, uh, of the podcast. Um, so yeah, if you want that five plus gigabytes of, uh, of podcasts, um, 
certainly uh, you know go download that and uh, torn it. Do whatever the hell you want with it. Uh, I love the redundancy. So if you want to put it out um, wherever, um, great. If you just want to download it and keep a copy of it for your personal archives for whatever, great. Don't care. Um, but yeah, I certainly recommend going going and and and, uh, and snagging that. So that's there in the sidebar uh, at vanupodcast.com. And I guess I can go over here and uh, and show you. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess the other couple notable things. Um, I released the uh, Seditions version of Sabotage audiobook um, out on Library. Um, the uh, I guess the cool video presentation that Pete Iyer put together. Um, and I also released um, for the Avanu Guide to Firearms, um, Avanu Guide to Firearms by Josiah Warren. Um, I put the transcript to my interview with uh, Ivan the Troll on Gun Printing 101. That is in there. And yeah, I guess that's uh, that's pretty much it for Avanu. Um, and yeah, I suppose that's that's uh that about wraps it up for for this uh, for this episode of uh, the Vonnie podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I know it's been a little while since I uh, uh I guess it's yeah, it's probably been a month since the episode with uh, with Lawrence Watson um on uh, natural law and uh, related subjects. Um, got uh, a couple more couple more coming up. Not going to uh, to tease too much, but uh, there's gonna be a, an interview which I, I think might surprise uh surprise some folks, but um, to a point where uh yeah, I just uh. <laughs> Whatever, whatever. Um, be having uh, one guest on, um, I know for sure. And then uh, beyond that, um, I have to do an episode, uh, a solo episode on health liberation, self liberation update episode. And um, then also the, um, um, I guess, my Vanu health liberation, self liberation guide. Um, I need to, uh, to put out a podcast for that as well. Um, otherwise, uh, you'll, I, I guess you'll see. I guess we'll, we'll both find out when, when, when content uh, will be released. Um, as I've said, uh, as I said to was it, uh, Jason Booth when he was on uh, last time, like I pretty much wake up at four or five and uh, whatever I am uh, feel inclined to uh, to spend my energy on that day um, is what I what I do. I don't uh, make a lot of plans. I, I um, whatever I whatever I want to do, whatever I can put my full t- full attention and energy and effort into, um, that's that's what I do. Um, so, yeah, we'll see what comes out. We'll see what comes out. Um, obviously, go subscribe on your favorite podcast, YourVaniPodcast.com, all that good stuff. Um, I thank you guys so much for uh, for staying here this entire, you know, if you're still here, great. Certainly appreciate it. Um, appreciate you checking out the podcast. Appreciate all the support. And, um, yeah, I, I really, really appreciate, uh, you know, as far as the, the, the Telegram group on Pasnia, all the folks that are hopping in there. We've got, uh, you know, we're about to hit 50 people in, the, in just the chat group. That's not the public. Um, that's not just the, the public channel. That's the chat group. Um, so, and they're all people that I know. Like, they're all, like, other than, like, three people, three or four people. Um, it's all people that I know. And um, I could not have planned this. Like, I, I could not have planned this. My, I, like, I just couldn't have planned it. But it's going good. It's going good. Um, it's going really, really good. And uh, all, all incredible folks, all, you know, just great, great, a lot, a lot of great stuff uh, coming at Pasnia this year. Um, if I can uh, talk and get out my words. But uh, yeah, lots of lots of really, really great things happening um, here at the Free Republic, uh, the Self Liberator's Paradise. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. Um, always remember, guys, Vani was yours for the making. Till next time. Is it possible to create pockets of freedom where personal autonomy is respected? In the novella, Hashtag Agora, Daniel LaRusso finds out the answer firsthand. After discovering Bitcoin, he becomes immersed in the cypherpunk underground. Encryption, ghost pads, temporary autonomous zones, and much more. He learns the benefits of freedom, of these tools for self-liberation, and how truly free individuals could conduct their affairs outside of the servile society. Based on real individuals in modern-day Berlin, Germany, Hashtag Agora gives you a practical representation of how freedom pioneers can carve out pockets of freedom in an otherwise enslaved world. Get your paperback copy today by visiting tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. Again, that's tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. And for more titles like this, please search for Liberty Under Attack publications on Amazon.